Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you haven't found your seat, and I encourage you to sit down, we're going to take a, uh, make a start in a moment. Welcome to you if it's your first time with us. Welcome to you if it's your 100th time. We love gathering together. And welcome to those joining us online and for those joining us uh, later as well. So this morning, it's our last service in our Christmas Emmanuel series. Later, Tom is going to be coming up and speak to, to us about the Temple of God. Uh, before that, we're going to spend some time worshipping. Um, and it's a, a shorter service today, so we're only going to be in about an hour. So we're going to have a slightly shorter time of worship. Um, the children are staying in with us all the whole way through. We love having our children with us. If they make a bit of noise, that's all right. We love being family together, don't we? So before we start a time of worship, I just wanted to read to you um, from Scripture, from the book of Peter, 1 Peter, just to focus our attention to where we, uh, when we come into worship, who we're worshipping today. We're coming to worship Jesus today, who died and rose again. So I just want to read to you from 1 Peter, and it says this in 1 Peter 2. It says, Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that's the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. That's why we come to worship today. We come to worship Jesus who died on a cross for our sins um, so that we would have the righteousness of God. So let's stand as we come into a place of worship. If you feel you have anything to contribute during this time of worship, please come and grab me at the front. Um, as it's a shorter time of worship, don't hold on to it too long because we might finish. So if you really feel that you've got something to bring, please come grab me as soon as you really feel that that's something for us all. So I'm going to pray and then hand over to the worship team. Yeah, Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you at this Christmas time we get to celebrate Jesus born amongst us, born as man. And we also come to worship you, Jesus, that you came for a purpose. You came to go to the cross in our place. By your wounds, we are healed. And we worship you, Jesus, today because by you, we have been healed and we are now right with the Father. We come now to worship you, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. We just ask that by your spirit, you would be here amongst us this morning. Amen. Thanks, Rob. No apologies. I'm full of cold. So we have dropped the keys down slightly. So some of you men might need to find your baritones. But I know you can do it. And some of you ladies then can sing not so high. It's, it'll all work out. Now you at home, just a cup of coffee. below
Father, as we move to the eve of a new year, we come before you. We say that you are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. You are the Lamb upon the throne. For some of us, we've closed the book on the Old Testament and the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. And we look forward to tomorrow, to resetting that and starting all over again. But we just come before you, the wondrous Saviour, the Prince of Peace, the Great I Am. And we sing to you how holy and how wonderful you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart the door you Hope of all I stand with you Sing that again Light of the world You step down into darkness You open my eyes and let me see The beauty that made this heart
since then we have a high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful presence here. Lord God, we thank you for your spirit at work amongst us, Lord God. And Lord, we thank you that you know exactly where we're at. Each one of us, Lord God, you know and you love each person in this room, Lord God. And whatever they're going through, Lord, whatever they're facing, Lord God, you can meet them where they're at, Lord God. You can pour out your spirit into their heart right now. Lord, we just welcome you to have your way amongst us, Lord God, to move in power amongst us, Lord God, and Lord God, to just reveal more of your grace and your love to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Um, Martin handed me an envelope this morning, and it was something we did in our life group on the 7th of May, 2019. And my first thing, we were writing down things that we were going to pray for that year. And the first thing on my things to pray for was reconciliation in our family. There'd been a massive fallout between two really close members of my family. And that reconciliation happened this year. I think it was five, five years altogether. So I just... I just wanted to share it because I just think it's you pray for things and you have to keep going and keep going and you don't always see the result really quickly, but don't ever get up because it was definitely a God thing. <laughs> okay. Amen. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my to our prayers, Lord, all together we'll love you, all together we'll love you, all together wonderful to me. So here I am. So here I am. God's really speaking to us this morning about providing and knowing our needs um, on the back of what uh, Sai shared about God knowing, you know, what we need. And um, just as we finish our time of worship, uh, Jane's just going to share one last encouragement that God really does know what we need and provides. Thank you. Uh, Happy New Year, Christ Church. I hope it's a good one for you all. Um, during, during the Christmas period, I was reading something about the, the Christmas story and uh, I'm in my 70s now, and it reveals something that I had never, ever thought about. So I wanted to share it with you. It was about the gifts that the Magi brought to Christ. And obviously, as little ones, we know that these gifts were incredibly valuable. There was gold, frankincense, and myrrh, really expensive gifts. But I'd never thought any more to it than just this was worshipping the king. 
But this person was writing and they said, but this wasn't just acknowledging who Christ was. It was the provision for the future. It gave the, the family the money to go and be in exile for the time that needed to be in exile. It gave the money to provide for Jesus to be taught in the temple, the scriptures. And it provided the other money for their living while they were trying to escape persecution. And it made me think, yes, Lord, I know in my life that there's been some sticky periods in my life where I've sat down and I've looked at my bank balance and I've gone cold because my outgoings are more than my income. But in this case, God was providing, not just for the now, but for the future as well. And my word to you is, uh, these are tough times for a lot of people, and my heart goes out to them. But God, when you love God and you trust God, he knows your need, not just now and in the future. And you can truly trust him to take you through the hard times as well as the good times, because he loves you. Amen. Thank you, Jane. And thank you for the worship team leading us this morning. I'm going to hand over to Georgie, who's going to do the notices. Thank you. Good morning. Please take a seat if you haven't already. Oh, there's jingle bells down here. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I'm just going to run through a couple of notices quickly uh, before inviting Tom up here to share from God's Word. And whilst I'm speaking, hopefully the offering boxes will go around. If you are a visitor, please feel free to let those pass you by. You can also give by card if you'd like to. There is a snazzy... Um, tablet at the back. back. Um, if you're not sure how to use it, one of the welcome team will happily help you and show you how to use that. So our week of prayer um, is coming up shortly. That starts next Sunday, running from the 7th to the 12th of January. And we have various midweek meetings. Yep, they have appeared. So you can very quickly take a photo of that if you want to. Um, but it has come out on the email and it will come out again tomorrow on the email. So please look out for the email and please put those dates in your diary and please come along to as many of those as you can. Um, and we have our quiz night. Ooh, can I get an ooh? Thank you. Uh, it is a very fun evening. If you've been along, you'll know how fun it is. It's a great event to invite people along to. Um, it starts at 7.30 on the 20th of January. Uh, tickets are £4 per person. And the link to book for that is on the weekly email. So go in, follow the link, book yourself a team. Maximum of eight people. Um, and you need to be booked in by the 17th, Wednesday the 17th. So please get signed up for that as soon as possible. It will be a fantastic night. Am I correct in thinking the youth are leading it? So it will be really interesting. It will be really, really fun. Um, okay, that's all the notices. And I'm just going to invite Tom up. So please welcome him up as he comes to Brings God Word. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good, good. Can we just have a round of applause for Rob? He led so well with a cold. <laughs> Rob, you sounded brilliant. Thank you very, very much to all the worship team. Hello, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Who can remember the last time they were hungry? I can't. I've been full for a solid week now. Um, but I trust you've all had a great Christmas period and are looking forward to 2024. My name's Tom. If you missed it, I'm one of the elders here at Christchurch. And I'm going to close our Christmas series on Emmanuel with... There are jingle bells here. I'm going to move these. I'll get distracted by them. Um, I'm going to be closing our, our Christmas series on the Temple of... Uh, on, on Emmanuel. And today we're going to be looking at uh, the Temple of God. So I've adhered to the doctrine of a three-point sermon this morning. Uh, point number one, the separation of man. I'm telling you now because it probably won't be that clear in the text. So point number one... The separation of man, that is that God is so holy, okay, in our sinful state, we couldn't even approach him. And in the Old Testament, God didn't simply dwell anywhere. That's point number one. Point number two, the intimacy of God. That God's plan has always been for us to know him and to love him and to experience his presence. And point number three, the purpose of the church Okay, that God calls us to open the doors of the church and be a people that expand on his plan to create a temple of living stones, no longer a, a temple of physical stones. There's an awful lot of paraphernalia up here. I don't know what's going on. Um, 
So kids, you're in, you've got to listen to me, you've got no kids group, so let's start with your help, I think. Uh, and basically, I'm going to need your help to give us the backstory of the Old Testament, so I hope you're listening, in order to be amazed afresh at the work of Jesus. So let's start bravely, he says, with the Little Sparks group. So who's in the Little Sparks group, which is our youngest youth group, which is all changing next week, isn't it? It's all changing. Who's going up? You are, you guys are, so I need a microphone and I'm going to take a chance here on a Joy's Boys. <laughs> so, a which one is this? Uh, that's Simeon, this I is think. Simeon. So Simeon, yeah. where does God live? It's an easy question. It's the first thing that's going to come into your head. Where does God live? Just take a shot. Doesn't matter. Where's the other one? Luke, where does, God, where does God live? Bethlehem. Well, yes. He, you can't argue with that one. You really... Look, I've got sweets here. Come and get sweets. I'm sorry, parents. Help yourself. Just help yourself. I don't want them in my house. Um, so, the, yes, he did live in Bethlehem. I was looking for heaven. That's fine. We'll go with Bethlehem. So, God... This, yeah, sure. But... God lived, lives in heaven. So generators, now it's your turn. So well, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> Who's in the generators group? Hands up. Ben, I'll come to you. Wait, I forgot what the question is. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. So where did God choose to dwell in the Old Testament? Hands up from generators group. Sam. Sensible answer. Um. Where does he choose to live in the Old Testament? In heaven. In the Old Testament. So what's, I'll give you a clue. What's the structure that we know in the Old Testament where God chooses to live? Oh, in the temple. In the temple! <laughs> Woo. Please have all the seats. That's right. So before Jesus, we read about how God chose to live in a temple in Jerusalem, no less. Literally inside a box, inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, could anyone just pop in and have a chat with God? No. Why? Because he's so holy, right? Imagine what would happen if you tried to stand next to the sun, okay? That's a little bit like God's holiness. It's so incredible and powerful that if we try and get even close to God, we simply just stop being alive because he's so holy. And once a year, the best and the cleanest person could go and meet with God in the temple. Which was just like this, right? So I'm going to be the priest that Sai weirdly brought. And in the temple, there were these big curtains. And the priest would literally go in the, in the curtain like this. And meet with God. Just like this, okay? So I'll be God. He'd be here. And everyone else is not here. So can you imagine what that was like? Year after year, generation after generation, through wars and peace and harvest and drought, through the good times, the bad times, through sickness and health, God was here and the people were there. For nearly a thousand years, God's people were where, where you are now, looking at the curtain, never seeing God, and God was dwelling within the curtain. But he loves us too much for that to get in the way, doesn't he? Very disruptive preach, sorry. <laughs> he doesn't want anything separating us from him. And that's why Jesus became angry. In the New Testament, when he was in the temple grounds, let's read it and let's explore. John 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found those who were, selling, who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, 
Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, this all took place, place in the court of the, tempo, te, blah, 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 court, the court of the Gentiles, which should be a picture on the next slide. So the court of the Gentiles was like outside. It's not a particularly great picture, but it's the best one I could find. The court of the tempo, Gentiles was outside of the temple. Now, everyone here, hands up if you can explain what a Gentile is. Just quickly put your hands up. Very good, you are Gentiles, that's correct. Because as far as I'm aware, nobody here has a Jewish mother. Does anyone have a Jewish mother? No, you're all Gentiles, great. Not great, but just interesting. <laughs> Move on. Um, so the court of the Gentiles was the only place on earth where non-Jewish people could carry out a sacrifice to God. So just think about that for a second. The whole earth... There's only one physical place where you can go as a Gentile and offer your sacrifice to God. And the Jewish leaders had filled up the whole space with tables, selling stuff. There's no space at all. There's just animals and profit. There's no room for evangelism. There's no space for outreach at all. There's no heart for the lost. There's literally physically no room. And Jesus became justly angry and damaged property. He caused a scene. He really caused a scene. And it's repeated in every gospel has an account of this. And when something's repeated in every gospel, it's something God really wants us to pay attention to. So you have these tables and these traders which are literally blocking access to God. And there's a separation that's happening. There's a barrier being created with God on one side and the people on the other. So God's frightening holiness was shielded by the temple and access given to people through sacrifice. But here, the leaders of the people had put obstacles in the way. But he loves us too much for this to get in the way, doesn't he? So Jesus tears into them. He's whipping and he's smashing and he's flipping over tables and animals are screeching and pots are crashing and robes are tearing and sandals are flying. And his anger was righteous because, among other things, his people were separated from him and they were being prevented to come to him. The separation of God from man in the fall at the beginning of the Bible is the start of an incredibly emotionally painful journey for both God and man. Sin leaves God no choice. You are just like me. In your natural state, your sin leaves you legally responsible for your crimes against God. Every evil word, every evil thought, every evil deed you and I have ever committed is a crime before God. And as a perfect judge, he has to have perfect justice. Imagine if someone was standing in the dock of the Old Bailey. Now, I've got my uncle here who was a judge in the Old Bailey, Old Bailey and did stand over people in the dock. So it's particularly poignant this morning. So you can imagine if somebody was standing in the dock of the Old Bailey, guilty of the most heinous crime against innocent people, and the judge says, I find you guilty of multiple murders, but I'm not sentencing you to prison. I'm releasing you without punishment. There would be outrage. That's not justice. We demand justice because God is a perfect judge. We have a justice system and we celebrate justice because that's the character of God in us, isn't it? And when my uncle Mike, when he was made a judge in the Old Bailey, this verse was shared with him by his predecessor from Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the law require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And it's wonderful that our justice system loves justice because that's the character of God. Because God has to punish the crime you have committed. Otherwise, he's not a perfect judge. But instead of punishing you, he chose to send his son to be crucified on your behalf. Jesus takes the sentence 
and he takes the punishment. And this is encapsulated so perfectly. You know when Jesus is taken to Pilate and then he's beaten and then they take him to the crowds and you've got that other character that appears, Barabbas, you know the story? And Pilate says, look, I'm going to release one of these people. Barabbas is a murderer and Jesus has done nothing wrong. And what do the people do? They release Barabbas, don't they? Barabbas, son of the father. So the son, us, the human son, the guilty one, the murderer. I mean, we've all murdered in our hearts. Let's be honest with ourselves. Jesus said it. If you hate someone in your heart, you've murdered them. If you looked with lust, you've committed adultery. We're all guilty of these sins. And we stand released because we bay for the blood of Jesus And that's why the cross was so bittersweet. He looked at the Roman torture. He looked at the flagellation. He looked at the beating and the whipping and the nails that would pierce his hands and feet. He looked at the total abandonment of his friends and of God and the fury and the wrath of the Father. And in Hebrews 12 too, it says that it was because of the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. His eyes were on joy. And what was that joy? Total unification of man to God. Total reconciliation with children to their father. Total forgiveness. Total peace with God. The chasm of sin was so immense... And the love of God so unquenchable that it required God himself to become a human and pay the price for your salvation. And that's what's available to us and to you, to all of us, is total forgiveness and friendship with God. There's no other way. And this is what happened in that moment, is that when Jesus cried out, it's finished, This barrier of separation with God inside, this temple curtain, was literally torn in two. And it didn't reveal a table tennis table. It didn't reveal a ping pong table or anything like that. But the temple of the the Holy of Holies... Oh, that one doesn't move. The temple was torn in two, rendered open, supernaturally. And that, that physical separation was completely removed which was spiritually important, obviously. And there's no longer separation. There's no longer divide. God doesn't dwell anymore in there. He doesn't dwell in a box, but he dwells in our hearts. And there's nothing preventing you. And this is really what I get get across. There is nothing preventing you from entering into the presence of God. Driving... Walking, working, weeping, laughing, mourning, even in the midst of sin, we cry, Father, I need you. Father, forgive me. Will you draw me close? And that's God's heart right throughout Scripture to be a people that carry his presence, to represent him, and to follow his lead. But we need to just identify it's not instinctual, is it? Look at the principles in Genesis 3. I'm going to take a chance on another generator's child. Put your hand up if you're in the generator's group. Ivy, come here. Right, this one's probably slightly more challenging, but I think you're going to get it. So in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve bite that fruit, and, um, uh, yeah, so they, they listen to the serpent, they eat the fruit. What's the next thing that they do? Do you remember? Um, they hide? Yes, that will do. Have all of those, because that's the last question. Just take the box. Sorry. They hide. Very good. They hide. And they make clothes, don't they, themselves, out of fig leaves. They try to cover themselves with sin. And we look back and we think, oh, if only they didn't try and cover their own sin. If only they had turned to God in repentance. Those are my kind of Christian eyes. They look at that and think, why did you run away? We know we can turn to God. Well, actually, I don't, I don't blame them on reflection. Repentance probably wasn't even a word in their vocabulary. They just separated themselves from the holy and righteous creator, and they've just ruined the universe. 
I'm surprised they didn't just emigrate immediately and just think, OK, I've got to get out of here. It must have been absolutely terrifying to hear the sound of God approaching them in that moment. Absolutely terrifying. And I don't mean that God was like stamping around saying, fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an unrighteous one and, and just wanting to just annihilate them because actually what God says to them is ju- judgment, excuse me, and mercy. That through Eve will come a serpent crusher. The promise of salvation. And this is it. We live in that age now. We don't have to run. We have no reason to run from God's presence. We have no reason to make up our own excuses for sin. We are a people released to engage perfectly with God, not one day a year, but every day of the year, 24 hours a day. So let's be a people that continually are filled with the presence of God, taking every day, not just to thank him that there's breath in your lungs and that your eyes opened, but to fill him with your presence. So my final thoughts are this. God wants to open you up. He wants to open us up. We need to be a people that are open. Jesus cleared the temple to allow the Gentiles to come in. He tore the curtain in two to allow access to God. And on the day of Pentecost, he poured out his Holy Spirit to each believer that they themselves, you, all of you, would be a temple of God. And that together, we would be the living stones that God is building as the church in this world. Christ church, you are the temple of God. As we gather, isn't it wonderful just to think, as we sit here in this room with the miserable December rain beating on its head, we are the living temple of God that are gathered together. It's so beautiful. And God wants open access to everyone. It's not a club. And so I just want to look at a few areas of the church where I think this applies the most. And I'm just going to take a section from Luke that we're going to look at to frame my final few paragraphs. If you love those who love you, What benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Stop there. So, friendships, they're important, essential, but cliques, groups of friendships that aren't open, they can be really damaging. So can I encourage you to think about your close friends in this church as a dynamic number, right, that's fluid. It ebbs and flows as people leave and join and come and go. It's really easy for us to think in a pack mentality. But Jesus modelled a life of spending time with people that were not like him, right? The New Testament calls us as Christians specifically associate with the lowly, in Romans 12, 16. So we should be looking at all times to include people in our social lives, those around us that can be so easily overlooked by the rest of our culture. We have a bias for people that look like us. That's how we're wired. But we need to have a bias for the last, the least, and the lost. Don't just entertain close friends who are going to invite you back, but invite people who you don't know. We mustn't judge. We mustn't judge people by how they look or how they sound or how they smell. I had this, um, it was a few years ago now, standing in the queue for uh, putting, paying for the garage. And there was a bloke in front of me who was, must have been about seven foot and he had like a leather waistcoat on and he had big earrings and tattoos and he was bald. And I was standing behind him, I thought, you are, you're a mean guy. You are emanating meanness uh, just from here. And the funniest thing happened, not, yeah, well, he turned and looked over his shoulder 
And I, made, I, I caught his eye. He looked at me and I looked at him. And he had piercing blue eyes. And just in that moment, I just saw the person, the child of God, this, this beautiful human being that God names. He knew the hairs on his head. He knew where he lies down. He knew where he gets up. And, and it was so convicting just in that moment. I made an assessment of who you are. And God, I believe, supernaturally just, it was like a pin drop moment. I, I could just see who he was before God and how deeply loved by God he was. And that's the truth for everyone on earth, isn't it? Is that God deeply loves them. And we make these assessments of people. And, and God's just like, but I see them like this. You see them like that. I see them like this. And thank God that's the case because, well, look at me. I mean, it's, it's, it's just to my merit, really, isn't it? But we should be careful, whoever we judge as Christians, there's a place for judgment, but the Bible's so much stronger on not judging that it is on correct judgment that it's just something easier to avoid. Judgment of people's behavior should be done with the utmost humility and gracefulness in a way that builds people up and doesn't tear people down. Think of Jesus' comment to the Pharisees. Why are you trying to take a splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in yours? Because we can so easily miss our own character flaws when we pass judgment on other people. So Jesus, he's always with the outsiders. He's out of the group. He's with the marginalized. He's with the down and outs. He's with the hopeless. He's with the forgotten. That's where he is. And he leaves this work as our responsibility, church. It's our responsibility that's given over to us as his hands and his feet to tear down every cultural and social barrier that gets in the way of the cross and the world. And to bring people into the new temple, this temple right here, Christchurch, the temple of God, not the building. We know this, don't we? The church isn't the building. The church is these people. There's no curtain. There's no tables. The only barrier is how seriously we take the word of God. That's terrifying. So will you allow it to shape you for 2024? Will you allow the word of God to take you out of your comfort zone? Small group leaders, the lifeblood of the church, you should be like a pack of hungry wolves on a Sunday morning looking to pounce on people who aren't connected, identifying them, making friends with them, inviting them in. Small groups are not a static group of people that never change. That's just fundamentally not what they are. They are groups that are growing and dividing and expanding as new people are invited in. Healthy things grow. It's easy to stay the same. It's easy to mix with people that are like us. That's the easy bit. That's why we all do it. But it's to the detriment of everyone else that can benefit from your friendship or your wisdom or your prayers as a believer. Right through the the Bible, God removes the barriers between us and him. He desires us to be unhindered by sin and able to be in fellowship with him day to day. He calls us as a people to demonstrate this in our culture, to be a people who seek out the downtrodden and the lowly and invite them into our homes and choose to see people how God sees them. Every, line we, every time we draw a line between ourselves and someone else, Jesus is always on the other side of that line. So are you in your comfort zone? Do you have a nice group of friends that just hasn't really changed in a few years? You're sitting comfortably next to the same people you've done for years. Allow me to challenge you that God wants to bring people into this church. And it starts with you and it starts with me with our attitude of being a people who remove barriers and who welcome people into God's presence. You can get right with God today. If something I've said about the the weight of judgment of sin, if that's resonated with you, if that kind of dragged on you, if you felt that tug inside, if you felt heavy as I was saying it, that's the Holy Spirit just saying, just this is not right. He's right on this, and I feel uncomfortable now. So I'm just going to lead us through a prayer of repentance so that everybody has an opportunity just to respond to God. You can know the presence of God in your daily life. Maybe you're sitting here today and actually you didn't open your Bible the whole of the Christmas period. You feel as dry as yesterday's turkey. 
God, that was a bad joke, that one. Can I encourage you to come and receive from God this morning and to be refreshed in his presence, to receive a touch from the Holy Spirit? So let's have the band up. Uh, We're going to have a final song. And I'm going to pray for everyone. And if you agree with what I'm saying, then just say amen afterwards and come and grab me. Dear Heavenly Father, when I consider the weight of my sinfulness, it is absolutely terrifying. When I consider every moment in my life where I have said, thought, or done things that were evil in your sight, it terrifies me that you stand as judge over humanity. And I have no defense, Lord God. I have no defense, Lord. But I plead for the blood of your Son to wash me of my unrighteousness, to wash away all the evil that I have done in my life. And I put my trust not in myself, but in your Son who was perfect and who died on the cross for me to have forgiveness. And I thank you that your promise to me is for righteousness and salvation and life eternal. Amen. Thanks, Rob. If you can stand and you're able to stand, why don't we just stand as we sing this last song. Just as I was preparing for this group of songs over a week ago, hence the reason I chose two higher keys, um, I was just playing it through back yesterday and I just felt a God moment when I was just going through and I just wanted to add this song in. And as we sing it, just contemplate that we're on the eve of a new year. And all that Thomas just shared. Are you going to go 100% for God? Or are you going to sit on the sidelines? Let's make this song a prayer.
just here I am Here I am You'll say just stay in a place of worship just for a moment longer let's not rush away just encourage you to put your hands out and uh, I just want to pray that we receive the spirit be filled afresh Father God we thank you we thank you that you sent Jesus we thank you that through the cross Jesus made a way for us to have access to the Father we thank you for that we thank you now that by your spirit you dwell in us And I pray right now for a fresh filling of the Spirit on every one of us, that we would know you dwelling inside us, that we would know the power of God at work in us and working through us. Father God, we do come. We say, here we are. Use us. We don't want to be filled with the Spirit just for our sake, as good as that is. We want to be filled by the Spirit to be used by you. You have a purpose for all of us. I pray you'd use us. Father God, where... You've struck a nerve this morning through Tom's words. I pray, God, that you would allow us to be open to be used by you. I pray you would allow us to be used by you. Help us to not put up any barriers that would prevent anyone coming to you. Help us to see others as you see them. Help us to not judge as we would judge, but see others through your eyes. God, we ask by your spirit you would give us eyes to see as you see. Help us to see the needs around us. Help us to step out of our comfort zone in 2024. Here we are for you, Lord. We ask that you would use us now. Amen. Amen. Um, If you have anything you want prayer for, please uh, come to the front. There's a few of us who would love to pray with you. If there's something uh, that's, you know, from this morning, if there's something that's going on in your life that you would like someone to stand with you in prayer, please come to the front. If you would like healing, we'd love to pray for you. Um, If you're a visitor today, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, We have our welcome zone in the corner. Uh, We'd love to serve you tea and coffee over there. So please, if you are new, um, it's your first time or first few times, please come and see us. But now we're going to have refreshments to the side. Um, Have a fantastic New Year's Eve tonight, whatever you're doing. And we'd love to see you next week in 2024. Bless you all. Thanks for joining us today.